So the sun can actually eject plasma into space. I like to think of it as interplanetary projectile vomit. <laughs> Blarg! First of all, I'd like to say hi. hi. And uh, <laughs> hi, Rob. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk to you about uh, things I love, uh, which are radio and space weather. Um, and uh, I got to say, I'll, somebody spoke about this club just before I got up here. This is pretty impressive. I got to say, this is one of the nicest venues I've ever been to and one of the most full rooms I've ever seen. So I'm pretty jazzed. So you should be proud of that. It's awesome. All right. What is space weather? Why do I care? I didn't know anything about space weather. And I said, I started out in meteorology. Um, if the sun came up in the morning where it was supposed to, and went down in the evening where it's supposed to, I'm like, we're good. <laughs> but after 20 years, well, close to 20 years of forecasting weather on Earth, the Air Force said, you know, you haven't done very well here on Earth. Try space. It's bigger, and not as many people live there. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up uh, as a space scientist. My career uh, started out uh, in space with the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center, where I am now. Well, I was there as an Air Force liaison. After I retired, I went and worked at, with uh, NASA at uh, um, Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, and I was part of their space radiation analysis group, which did pre-flight in-flight and post-flight radiation uh, monitoring and prediction for the astronauts. And that was where I first learned that space radiation can be rearranged to spell satanic road pie. <laughs> I shared that with my supervisor and shortly afterwards found myself back in Colorado <laughs> working at the Space Weather Prediction Center. So uh, anyhow, Let's get rolling here. Um, first of all, um, a bunch of folks helped me out with this. Uh, in particular, uh, Patricia Doherty from uh, Boston University, Mihail Kudrescu, a colleague of mine, and George Millward, both at Swipsy, and then Dolores Knipp at CU Boulder. If you ever have a chance to go see her talk, she does some excellent space weather history. And the, uh, I've got a, a little bit I stole from her. All right, so we'll look at uh, space weather phenomena and impacts. Specifically, uh, we'll look at the events of 2017 September, because that was the biggest events of this particular solar cycle, Solar Cycle 24. I'll also mention a CME that happened in uh, July 2012, because as a planet, we got pretty lucky. Um, then because it's a room full of radio amateurs, I thought it'd probably be good to relate all this to what you do. And then we'll... Uh, We'll wrap it up. Now, fair warning, the last time I did this stack of slides, three hours. <laughs> there are a lot of questions, and I love questions. I love answering them. Um, but um, yeah, it, <laughs> I'm going to try, try and go <laughs> faster, right? <laughs> yeah. So let's, yeah, I'll keep the pace picked up because, um, yeah, the problem is I get sidetracked and then, pfft, we're back to satanic road pie again, and who knows? <laughs> All right. Why do we care? Well, here's a great example of why we care. This was in 1967, so we're looking at the Cold War. Um, uh, we have some radar uh, up along the Arctic Circle to look for incoming intercontinental ballistic missiles. Now. Back in the day, the doctrine was one of the first things you want to do is wipe out the radars so they can't see the missiles coming and they don't know where they're going. So if a radar or a whole network of radars simultaneously went down, the pucker factor would go way up. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and I believe this was May. Um, there was a, a huge region of sunspots that had rotated 
into an earth-facing orientation, and it let loose with a big flare. And associated with that flare was a gigantic radio burst because solar flares can emit across all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light, you can actually see a white light flare. We look at it in x-rays, in extreme ultraviolet. A lot of different ways that you can see this. Well, it also puts out energy on radio frequencies. It just happened to pick the frequency that was used by those radars. Now, first they didn't know that. Radars went down, and people in Cheyenne Mountain said, this can't be good. And they started the crank turning to get things in motion. So alert crews were sent to the bombers that carried nuclear weapons at SAC. And they started getting things spooled up. Um, and around that time, there was a gentleman working in Cheyenne Mountain who was a meteorologist who said, hold up, this could be the sun. Fortunately, they were able to turn things off before those planes launched. And one of the things they figured out was the ionosphere was so trashed that had they launched, they wouldn't have been able to call them back. So, yeah. Now, I was fortunate enough to speak with a scientist at the National Solar Observatory who had been in the former Soviet Union. And he said they'd heard about this event and similar things were happening on the other side of the world. He said, but those records have probably been destroyed. Um, but imagine that. So as you, can, as you can guess, the Air Force took kind of a keen interest in this. They said, hmm. Now Dolores has another story about a few thousand sea mines near Vietnam in the 70s that just started randomly going off one day because of a geomagnetic storm. And that can really change your day if you're just out kind of floating around. And <laughs> things start exploding around you. A lot of mines. So uh, yeah, so this is why uh, one reason space weather is important beyond just you know, what it does to our radios, does things to other people's radios too. All right, so what is our nearest star the sun have that makes it capable of producing space weather. Well, it's got the, the three ingredients. It's like the fire triangle, but for space weather. You need some magnetism. So the sun forms magnetic fields. And as those magnetic fields form, they're pushed up by convection. And they're pushed up through the solar surface. Now, the last piece of the puzzle is differential rotation. So the sun rotates. It makes a lap every 27 days on average. But the middle, the equator, rotates faster than the poles. It's not a solid object. So you push magnetic field up through the solar surface, and then you rotate it at different rates, and guess what it does? gets twisted up. Anybody ever take a rubber band and just keep twisting it? What happens eventually? Breaks. Breaks. You ever have one of those wind up little balsa wood planes with a propeller? I can love those things. Have I broken those? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Fortunately, it did not result in a humongous explosion of energy in my face. The rubber band just broke. On the sun, however, big release of energy. That magnetic field breaks and then it reconnects. And in that process of breaking and reconnecting, it accelerates outward energy, electromagnetic energy, particles, protons, heavy ions out into space. Imagine the Jaws theme playing as you go from left to right. Dun, 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 dun. That's what's happening here. That's what I hear in my head when I see this on the satellite imagery or the imagery from ground-based telescopes. <laughs> okay, you got a few sunspots here emerging. Here is magnetic flux. Positive is white, negative is black. Now, as time goes on, you can see 
that, it gets more and more gnarly. It's an official space weather word. No, it's, uh, it's large and magnetically complex. The bigger it is and the more magnetically complex it is, the higher the likelihood of a big flare. We classify these regions based on their characteristics, both in hydrogen alpha or white light imagery, as well as the magnetic characteristics. And those are mapped climatologically to a flare probability for 24, 48, and 72 hours. I can't tell you when this thing's going to happen. It's just like, I, as a meteorologist, I couldn't say three miles north of Longmont, there'll be a tornado at 4 o'clock on April 2nd. Yeah, I can't do that. Similarly, I can't do that with flares. Now, the worst thing is, at least with the radars I had, Doppler weather radar, I could see rotation. I could see characteristics that told me a tornado is probable. I could issue a tornado warning. We don't have that yet for flares. I want that. So if you get it, let me know. But there's a lot of people working on trying to find flare precursors. And we have some of the most amazing imagery of the sun now that we've never had before. Here's a solar cycle forecast. I figured I'd spill the beans early. I wasn't going to save it till the end, but the projection for the cycle right now, mm, July of 2025. So we should be at the very bottom. So with any luck, it can only get better. When do we know where the bottom is? After we're not in the bottom anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have to, wait to, we have to wait till it happens, and we go, yep, that was it. <laughs> it's not getting any lower. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, so a peak of 115. Um, plus or minus 10 in July 2025. Min, maybe April of this year, plus or minus six months. We throw big error bars on this because it's not an exact science. Don't we have uh, sunspots, uh, sunspots already on the Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, we're in this kind of transition period now. You'll see old cycle 24 sunspots and new cycle 25 sunspots together. But, they're very rare right now. All right. Now, it's an 11-year solar cycle on average. So, and most, you know, if you've operated for any length of time, you know this, um, and you probably follow it. Um, I didn't, again, I wasn't paying that much attention as a meteorologist. I probably should have been. And even as an amateur radio operator, I just turned the radio on. I was, you know, I was 15 years old. Turn the radio on, see what happens. Guess what? That's still good advice, even when you know stuff. Was anybody around here for the solar cycle in the, in the mid-50s, 56 ish time frame? Oh, I am so jealous. I read stories, and I'm like, oh, my God. It's unbelievable. I'm kind of glad, though, that I wasn't there when that happened, because then I would want it all the time, you know? <laughs> all right. As you can see, we're kind of creeping down. Here's 2020. I've got, there's probably a newer chart. This one's from December, but yeah, we're still kind of bottoming out. Actually, if you look, this is, this is the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. So this, uh, this radio flux we've been measuring, actually they've been measuring in Penticton in Canada since 1947. And it's used as a proxy for the sunspot number. So it follows the solar cycle really well. And many of you, if you look at propagation models or stuff like that, you look for F10.7. What is that number? And uh, actually, our, our, uh, <laughs> just our extrapolation takes it lower than it had ever been, <laughs> ever been measured. So everybody's like, ah. So we got to work on that. Take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so space weather. So we know that we need magnetism, convection, differential rotation, big, ugly sunspots, twisted up magnetic fields. 
what are the three things that we monitor at the Space Weather Prediction Center? Well, we look for three things, the big three, R, S, and G. I like it because it kind of rhymes. Radio blackouts, that would be of interest to people here and to me. Um, space radiation storms, believe it or not, can also have an impact on HF propagation. And finally, geomagnetic storms. So we look for all these things. The radio blackout happens during that breaking and reconnection that I told you about. And that, when we have sensed it with our spacecraft, it's already here. It happened eight minutes ago on the sun. That's how long it takes to get to our spacecraft. Now, S is for space radiation. So this is looking at the sun. This is called a coronagraph. This disk here is blotting out the sun. It's creating an artificial eclipse. This is a little stick that holds it in place. And that little white circle is where the sun is. All those little speckles on there are particles hitting the charge couple detector, the CCD. They're hitting the camera and making that snow. Those are protons and heavy ions, bam, and electrons that have been accelerated in the process of that flare. Now, flare, when we see it, it's already here. Protons, I can give you minutes to hours of warning because they don't move at the speed of light. They're sub-relativistic. So they're slower, and depending on where they happen at the, on the sun, if we're looking at the sun, if they happen from regions on the right side of the sun, which is, believe it or not, the west limb, um, those get here really quick. They're magnetically well connected to Earth by magnetic field lines that extend from the sun to the Earth, and they ride those like rails. It's light rail for particles. If it happens over here, it's going to take longer for it to get to us. So, you know, I can, those are fine with me. I can give you, you know, a couple hours, four hours maybe or more of warning. These I hate because they're here quick. I get a big flare and I'm like, ah! So I'm dealing with the flare, putting out the advisories, the alerts and warnings. Well, alerts, I don't have any warnings. I'm putting out the alerts. It happened. Here's how big it is now. <laughs> oh, it just crossed this threshold. And right on the heels of that, Bam! Protons. And I got to type stuff into a model really quick and get an answer. What's the probability that we're going to get a particle event from this particular flare? Bigger flare, bigger probabilities. All right. And then finally, here's another coronagraph. These are all on board the same spacecraft called SOHO. There's the sun. There's the occulting disk. There's a blob of plasma. So the sun can actually eject plasma into space. I like to think of it as interplanetary projectile vomit. <laughs> Blarg! <laughs> and if you have kids, it's a great way to explain it. Because I get a little school groups through here. I'm like, anybody ever been puked on? Yeah! <laughs> they know! Blah! The sun does that. <laughs> so that stuff, if it's Earth-directed, can get here in hours to days. And the thing about that is it carries a magnetic field with it. So part of that, as that plasma rips off the sun, a magnetic field is torn off of there and starts moving through space. Billions of tons of material at millions of miles an hour heading to Earth, if it's aimed right, Getting here in hours to days, the fastest ones can get here in like 17 hours. What happens when they get to Earth? Well, Earth has a magnetic field. This blob has a magnetic field. Have you ever played with magnets? They can do a few different things, right? They can stick if they're lined up right, or they can repel. If the magnetic field in that blob is oriented 
with the magnetic field at Earth in such a way that they stick, we're going to get big storm. We're going to get big geomagnetic storms. If it's off or opposite, we'll still get some activity, but not nearly as much. When do I know how that magnetic field is oriented? 45 minutes before it gets here, or less, because we have a buoy out in the ocean. Well, OK, in space. It's a big ocean. We have a buoy out in space, a spacecraft called, well, we have two, ACE and DISCOVER. And those tell us about the solar wind, the characteristics, including the magnetic field. So as this thing comes past that, we get our first glimpse of the magnetic field. Now, as a meteorologist, I like to liken this to the stuff um, that I was familiar with on Earth, like hurricanes. Say you see a beautiful easterly wave coming off Africa, and you say, look at that. That's gorgeous. That could become a tropical cyclone or a hurricane. And then you don't see anything for the next <laughs> two days. And the next thing you get is a phone call from Cuba. <laughs> and you live in Florida. That's kind of what it's like. So as soon as we see this thing leave, we try and model it. We get parameters like speed and width and orientation and direction. And we plug those into a numerical model that tells us when it thinks the thing's going to get here. And then we look at things like, what's the solar wind actually doing? And how well is the model capturing that? We take those into consideration when we make our forecast. That gives us time to put out a watch, just like a hurricane watch. We can put out a geomagnetic storm watch hours to days, and typically days in advance, 24 hours or more in advance. We'll put out a watch and say, it's coming. People can do things with that. Power companies in particular are concerned with this because once that whacks our magnetic field, and our magnetic field's going blah, blah. If, and you can hear that. No, I'm just kidding. You can't hear that. But um, take a giant fluctuating magnetic field and superimpose it over a long conductor like a power line. What do you get? Current. In the 1800s, it happened on telegraph lines, the Victorian internet. And uh, <laughs> that's actually the title of a book about the telegraph system. Apparently, some romances sprung up on telegraph lines. Who knew? But in this case, a giant magnetic field fluctuating over the telegraph lines caused things to catch fire, to operate without the batteries. Yes, yes, I am. 1856. That is an amazing book to read. It's called, uh, about the Carrington event, called uh, The Sun Gods. And it's about Richard Carrington. And uh, it reads like an episode of Nova intertwined with an episode of Jerry Springer. It's incredible. <laughs> There's science, adultery, and stabbing. I mean, my goodness. It's amazing. I was just ready to read about science stuff, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so uh, anyhow. Yeah, let's see. So, that, yeah, we got it here. It's stuck. It's super, yeah. So we got the power lines, right? So we got to let the power companies know because they can do things like defer maintenance or uh, reduce production or other things, and they have a checklist that they can go through to prepare for this to protect the grid. And we are closely uh, integrated with FEMA and with the North American Electric Reliability Corporation uh, to help maintain the grid. It's one of the big things we do. All right, this is just a sequence of events. Uh, it's a, I actually have a video, and you can find it on the internet, but I never have luck with the videos and the slides, so I just did some stills. Big flare, puke, traveling puke. <laughs> ah. That's where it hits us. And then, you know, I talked about field lines breaking and reconnecting. That can happen at Earth, too, when this thing hits it. So we break field lines, pow, and then they reconnect in the magneto tail. And when they reconnect, wham, another big burst of energy, right? 
and that accelerates particles back to the poles, and guess what we get? Aurora. Yeah, because those particles then interact with our neutral atmosphere and cause the aurora, which you shouldn't whistle at, I learned. Apparently, you don't want to summon the aurora. All right, so here's a sequence of events. Boom, I get an X-ray flare. I can send out an alert and tell you it just crossed the M1 threshold or the X threshold. Flares are rated according to A, B, C. Don't care about A and B. Nobody cares about those. C is common. M is moderate. X, extreme. We always have trouble with the alphabet. A, B, C, M, X, you know. <laughs> Radio burst. We can get those. We'll issue an alert for that for certain types. Particles, we may have time to give you a warning, and then we can give you an alert. For plasma, for the blob, for the CME coronal mass ejection, we can put out a watch for the geomagnetic storm that will be associated with it. Once it hits the ACE or Discover spacecraft, we can put out a warning. And then once it hits Earth and starts showing up on the ground magnetometers that we use to measure Earth's magnetic field, we put out an alert. As it crosses different thresholds, again, a lot, this is all about thresholds. Um, for the particles, we look at a particular energy range, 10 mega electron volts, 10 MeV electrons, or protons, and we look at 100 MeV protons. Um, I used to tell the astronauts, because a high enough energy proton go right into your spacesuit, go right into your body, screw up your DNA. If it blows it away, that's cool, we'll make more. It's like Doritos. But if it damages your DNA and it replicates, what do you end up with? Mutation and cancer. So astronauts are radiation workers. And our role at SHRAG was to keep that radiation dose as low as reasonably achievable, which meant proton storm, no outside recess. Don't go outside to play space station and do a spacewalk. Because they can reach their career radiation limit if they're outside in one of those storms, and they'll never go into space again. They all wear dosimeters to keep track of their radiation dose, both individual dosimeters and there's dosimetry all around the space station. And it's cool, when I started there, there were plastic things we'd send up with little detectors and a square piece of plastic, and they'd fly them, and then they'd come back, and we'd analyze them. Now, it's a USB that they can plug in and get the data back. Sweet. It's sweet. And we've come a long way because the initial radiation sensors, these uh, detectors, um, if you're thinking back to Tennessee Valley, they'd eat them. Yeah. And then they'd have to retrieve them. So when I was invited to work in the lab by the lab director, Ramona, and she gave me the books to read, I got to that, which was only a few pages in, and um, I went to her, I'm like, hey, <laughs> Really? <laughs> She's like, oh, no, no. <laughs> we don't do that. So, yeah, it's pretty slick. And then, um, yeah, plasma, talked about that. This, who has heard of the K-index? Okay, so the K-index is a geomagnetic index. It runs from zero to nine. It's chopped up into thirds. You get 27 different categories. Zero is nothing's going on. Nine is bleh, or bleh. the problem is it saturates at nine. So you can have a nine or a nine. And that's one of the drawbacks of that particular scale. There's also the AP index. That's a planetary index like KP, but it's produced every day. All right. Question. Yes. No, 
We are not. Um, so we calculate a KP. A lot of places do, actually. We do it in real time, which is what one of the things that makes us unique. And we can watch it. Um, we do every minute recalculation. Now, it's a three-hourly index, so it only gets reported every three hours. But in the forecast office, we can actually monitor input from different magnetometers to see how it's rising and when we're crossing a particular threshold. So that gives people a heads up. Um, the official keeper of the KP index is a group in Potsdam called GFZ. And GFZ are the initials associated with German words that are long and unpronounceable for Rob. Uh, but they're, they're awesome. They're in Potsdam, GFZ. They are the official world keepers of that record. All right, radio blackouts. These are the space weather scales. Just like the hurricanes have scales, we made space weather scales. Because when I told people that, hey, the 10 MeV electron flux or proton flux is now above 10 particle flux units, operators would go, what? What does that mean to me? So we needed a way to translate that space weather forecast or science speak into something that people could use who depend on this stuff. So if I say, hey, S1 is minor, space radiation storm. S5 is extreme. And then there's bits in between. And we map those to the particular uh, fluxes and energies. People are good. I'm like, S3, I know what to do. S3, good, got it. Because we have the impacts here. And we have what the uh, particular measure is and how often they occur. So it's a really handy chart to kind of get an idea of the risk associated with these different things and the different levels. Same for radio blackouts and geomagnetic storms. Now, this is the most awesome part. I got out of meteorology about the time I was starting to get bored. Why was I getting bored? Because as a forecaster, day to day, there was very little I could do to improve over the numerical models that meteorologists use to make forecasts. Now, I could still add value during severe events, you know, putting out warnings, you know, short fuse forecasts to help emergency managers, to help people be safe in their homes. But day to day, adjusting the temperature, I couldn't really make a good, you know, I couldn't improve over the model very much. The wind forecast, not so much. So I was starting to go, hmm, it's kind of tough. <laughs> what do I, so I got into space weather. Wide open, it's like the 1960s in numerical modeling. We don't have a lot of observations. In a way, the observation is kind of like the 1800s. Um, and we're, we're still learning about the process. So it's a really exciting place to be. But in the 10 years that I've been there, I've seen an increase of 240% in the number of numerical models we use. The some are empirical, based on climatological data. Uh, some are physics-based, and some are kind of a hybrid of the two. So it's a really exciting time. So we've got, this is the model I told you about that tells us when the blob's going to get here. If you look at the top there um, on the upper left, that little streak coming out, the green dot, I don't know if you can see it, is Earth. And that blob above it is a CME that just misses us, just scrapes us. We call it a glancing blow. Then we have other things like uh, a model of the magnetosphere. This is called geospace. So we can see uh, how the magnetosphere is responding to the solar wind environment. And you can see when CMEs pass this thing, and it goes Bleh! geoelectric or geomagnetic field model. So we can actually model Earth's geomagnetic field response to the storm. And finally, a geoelectric field map that we can use to provide information to the power companies. So they can say, how much induced current am I going to see on my lines? What's the uh, you know, volts per kilometer? What am I going to see? Usually it's millivolts, but and you can see some areas where, like these, found out that the, the corridor right up through DC and up into the northeast 
is a real hot spot, which kind of worked because then when you say to people, we need money to research space weather and its impacts, and by the way, you're right at the epicenter, people, they're on it. They understand. It is. Well, it's Canada. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're actually, it's actually going to. We are actually working together with the Canadians, and hopefully this year, although I can't guarantee it, because you've got two different governments working on this, but eventually it's going to be continuous up through North America. And similarly, Mexico has power plants, and we're connected to their grid as well. And they have set up magnetometers. They've set up space weather forecasting in Mexico just in the last five years. And it's awesome. And they, <laughs> they had a situation where they simultaneously had a hurricane, an earthquake, and a space weather event happening all at the same time. And their civil defense authorities were not happy. They're like, what are you doing to us? All right, so phenomena, solar flares, no warning, tens of minutes, HF calm on the sunlit side of the earth, that big burst of energy, EUV energy is gonna pump up the ionosphere and it's gonna cause a radio blackout. You're gonna have too much going on, too much ionization. Um, you can get Radio bursts, if you have a radio burst on a VHF or UHF frequency, that can be a problem. We've seen it happen to GPS. Suddenly GPS was unavailable. You're like, what happened to GPS? Radiation storm, those particles coming in at the poles can actually interact with the polar atmosphere in such a way that you get all your radio waves absorbed in the D regions of the ionosphere. So D, E, F, F1, F2, yeah, so you get D region absorption. That D region absorption, this uh, HF blackout lasts for an hour on average. Maybe a little more if you have subsequent flaring. This lasts for days. It takes days to recover from that. Finally, geomagnetic storms. Um, we can give you advance notice. The effects are typically 24 hours, but it can be more if you have back-to-back -back blobs of plasma. Um, it affects the power grid, as I mentioned. It can also affect G GPS, GNSS. Gives you the aurora, which is cool. It's the most, that's the only real visible manifestation of space weather, right? How many people in here have seen the aurora? All right, that's awesome. I haven't, you know when, you know when I saw my first tornado? Even after being stationed in Tornado Alley, twice, after I retired as a meteorologist. We were driving away from the Denver airport. My wife pointed over. She says, isn't that a tornado? And I said, why, yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> As a meteorologist, I'm fairly confident. <laughs> so I'm guessing that I'm going to have to. No, I actually got to see the aurora just last, uh, well, let's see, was this February? Yeah, earlier this month. Um, I was on a plane in the Yukon territory. Now. The K index was zero to one. So the aurora just looked like this tiny little shaded light area. Not the big vivid green monster stuff. But if you had a really cool camera, you could tease that out. Um, but I did get to see it, so I can say that. All right. Now, how do we get the information out? We call people, like NASA. If I got my NASA buddies that shrag the space radiation analysis group, I'll call them up and say, hey, look, we talk to them every day, at least once a day, more often if they're on an EVA or if there's an event. And they have to live within a certain radius of Johnson Space Center because they're expected to respond and be on console talking to the surgeon, flight surgeon and flight uh, director uh, when these events happen. So they carry, um, well, now they, we used to have the Blackberries, now they have iPhones, I think, but. You get woken up at all hours, and you got to be there. Um, but we also talk to commercial airlines. We talk to the power generation, FEMA, and so on. Pigeon racers call us. We don't call them, but they call us.
because pigeons get lost in geomagnetic storms. When the K index is four or greater, pigeons don't come back. Who cares? Well, pigeons can cost million dollars. Yes, pigeon racers, 1.2 million, I think now, is the record holding pigeon sale. They're like thoroughbred horses in pigeon form. And people bet on them. And it's a multi-million dollar endeavor. Is that not wild? I talked to a guy from Taiwan who said, where they race them there, the people who breed those pigeons, their houses are like compounds with razor ribbon and stuff because people try and break in and steal their pigeons. So I get calls from pigeon people. And I have a new respect for them because I had no idea. Now, you can sign up to get emails. There's on our webpage, there's a place that says subscribe. You can subscribe and get email delivery of our watches, warnings, and alerts. And you can pick the ones you want. We have a website, and I'll show you that later if I have time. Uh, we are on Twitter and Facebook because that's now a thing. <laughs> it was news to me. It was the early days were really kind of weird, but we're getting better. I made a post, my favorite post, the one I got the most hits on was I said, okay, the energy released in a, in a particular uh, form of eruption called a filament liftoff, which may or may not be associated with flare, but does produce a CME. Uh, I, I uh, calculated how many um, AA batteries that would take, and uh, that was very popular. How much energy, how many AA batteries? It was a lot. And it was right around Christmas, so everybody was thinking about batteries. And then we have traditional media. So sometimes we'll get calls from uh, newspapers or uh, online things or TV stations or radio stations. And, and the TV stations, they'll actually come out and talk to us sometimes and film. One station come out one time, and I guess they wanted to do a different kind of camera angle. And I'm thankful that this camera is not at that angle. But it was as if the guy was laying on the floor shooting up the nostrils of the space scientists they were talking to. So, like, why am I looking at Joe's nostrils? All right. Now, let's talk about at a real event. Summer 2017. Not a whole lot going on. So up here is x-rays at geosynchronous orbit gathered by the GOES spacecraft, which also does your weather imagery, right? Your satellite photos. Not a whole lot going on until September. So, you know, June, July, August, meh, a little bit, not much, and then wham. That's why I said relatively exciting. Look at protons. Dun, 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 pretty stable. A little bit of a blurb there, but look at that. Wham! Big proton event. Cosmic rays. Oh, something happens here. Here's the deal. Cosmic rays, that's particles and heavy ions from outside our galaxy that come in. And that's the biggest threat to astronauts trying to go to Mars for radiation. During solar maximum, when we get the most proton events from the sun, it actually squashes down the cosmic rays. And during solar minimum, like now, the cosmic rays are off the scale. They're, they're all over the place. Magnetometers, okay, at GEO. So this is on the GO spacecraft as well. We had a magnetometer, and you know you can see your daily variations as it makes its way around the magnetosphere, and then bam, look at that. That's telling you that the magnetosphere took it right in the face. All right, so what was this associated with? See that where it says Earth scale? There's a little tiny dot in there. That's Earth size compared to the sunspots. They're big. And they're gnarly. Here's another Earth. Here's the magnetic field. This active region is what gave us all the trouble. And look how it's lined up. Oh, it couldn't be any better. Center disk right at Earth, right on the Sun-Earth line. Oh, yeah. All right, x-rays. Oh, you can see some big flares. One there, and that was on the 6th. And then later on the 10th, another big one. Proton event 
on the six. See how the flare happened and then the protons got here? Here, flare and protons almost simultaneously because by then, it takes 13 and a half days to get around the disk, right? So a few days later, it had rotated into that spot where I said, oh, it's really well connected. <laughs> yes, that's what you see. When it was center disk, it took them a while to get here, so I could put out a warning. We live and die by a lot of time series plots, as you can imagine. So <laughs> time on the x-axis, whatever we're looking at on the y-axis. Here's some electrons. Um, here's magnetometer, so bam, and then brrr, that's the CME hitting, and then we get more activity here. Now, guess where we were in the solar cycle when this thing happened? We're on the downslope. We are three years out from MIM. The biggest event of solar cycle 24 happened as the solar cycle was almost bottoming out. Wasn't the Carrington on an upslope? It might have been. I don't know for sure. I think it was at maximum, but I'm yeah. pretty sure it was. Yeah, so what happens is, you know, the frequency goes up, but it doesn't rule out infrequent but significant events out on the wings. So, between 4 September and 11 September, in that one week period, we issued 123 different alert watches and warnings, which for us is, that's pretty big. Um, five more than issued in that week than the entire month prior. This chart shows you all the different alerts, watches, and warnings that can be put out for X-ray events, when they cross the different thresholds, for radio events, for type two and type four bursts, for protons, electrons, geomagnetic storms from K4 all the way up through K9, um, the watches that I mentioned, and then we used to do something called stratospheric warming, but we haven't done that in years. All right, so that was a very busy, busy, busy time in the forecast office. We typically have two folks on duty, 24 hours a day, but we call in extra people, just like they do in a weather forecast office when there's tornadoes, we call in extra people. Any storm spotters here? All right, that's why I got my radio license. I heard him, I had a general coverage public service receiver. My dad was on a fire department, so I was tuning around one day, caught these guys on a weather net, and I was like, that's cool, and I like weather. I initially thought I couldn't be a meteorologist, though, because my kindergarten teacher told me I drew raindrops the wrong way. <laughs> and I really couldn't draw clouds really well, and I figured that's what you did as a meteorologist. <laughs> All right. So there was an X9 flare. So you usually have a category, a class, CMX, and then you have a number, related to the solar flux units, the amount of energy. So X9 is pretty decent. There have been X20s. But for this solar cycle, this was a big deal. It was the largest of the solar cycle and the largest since September 7th, 2005. And we got an S3 as well. So that's a moderate, let's see, minor, Moderate, hmm. maybe it's severe. We got a big radiation storm out of that. We had flares before it, we had flares after it, and later after it. So an X8, X1. So this was a busy time. This was the region. This was what we put out on the web page. So if you go to our web page, right on the front, we'll have stuff like this. And this is also the information that will come in your, in your uh, emails. Wide area of blackouts, loss of contact for up to an hour over sunlit side of Earth. Wham. We have a product called DRAP, the D region absorption product. DRAP will tell you, among other things, the highest frequency affected by 1 dB absorption as well as other things. If you go to the web page, you'll see tabs for different frequency uh, or for different bands 
that you can click on and see what the impacts will be. And it gives you an estimate of when things will recover. So that's important. And this is an empirical model. So it will say, OK, based on what we've observed, we think things will be better at this particular time. So you can see where the subsolar point is <laughs> right over uh, the Atlantic and Africa, Europe. Now, does anybody ever look at the weak signal propagation reporter, Whisper Network? I love that thing. I love that thing. Oh, man. So what I did was I pulled all the data because they save everything. And as a scientist, that's glorious. They save all that data. So I collected all the spots, all the, all the connections for that day uh, during this period from 0700 to 1900, so 12 hours of data. Now keep in mind, these just aren't on the sunlit side of the Earth. I captured all around the world. So even on the, on the uh, night side, I had you know, that as well. But look at the hit it took when we had the X2, wham, and then the X9. closing in 20 minutes. All right. All right. 10 minutes. Holy crap. All right. We're going to go fast. Note that after the flares, see how 14 megahertz picked up? You get this little bump after the flare subsides. So after the blackout's over, you get a little bump. All right. Here goes Rob talking really fast. It interfered with the hurricane net. It caused problems. There was a radio burst that was near GPS frequencies. And you had an impact. You see the dropout on L2 and the depression on L1. So the two GPS frequencies. So you had an outage for a while. When we model the storm, we parameterize it. We throw it into a model. We watch the A spacecraft to see the thing get here. Bam, it got here. And then it hits the ground magnetometers. Here's our forecast for that event. We said, all right, September 7th, we had it fairly early on September 7th. We expected at least moderate geomagnetic storming, so KP is 7 or greater. We'll put out a, a watch for 7 or greater. And then 8th, we had more and through the ninth. So we had three days worth of activity forecast based on that CME. And that's what we got. From the 7th, that top is the magnetic field at Discover, which is the spacecraft about a million miles from Earth that is our buoy. So you can see it hit the first one on the 7th, late on the 7th, the second one, and then the third one uh, midday on the 8th. Here's the KP indices. 8s, almost 9s. So we get up to KP of 8, which is severe. That was a big storm. It was a decent storm. <laughs> it wasn't the biggest, but for me, since this is the only one I'd worked, that was big. It was the biggest one. <laughs> it also, the geomagnetic storm, had an impact on WAS. See this bite out of crime here? That missing chunk for a system that helps aircraft land using GPS, it was affected in this region. And I asked Patricia Doherty, the lady I mentioned earlier in the acknowledgments, whether she thought this was hurricane related or geomagnetic storm related. And her learned opinion was it was geomagnetic storm related. And that made sense because GPS was affected. Same kind of thing happened where there was no hurricane. This is over in Europe. They have a similar system to WAS, the Wide Area Augmentation System, called EGNOS, the European GNOS. I don't know what the G and NOS stands for, but as you can see, it was eroded in the northern part on the 8th. This is important if you're landing aircraft using GPS. All right, the near miss. This region, 1520, we give them numbers, rotated off and was three days off the 
west limb. So it had rotated three days around. And then it let loose with one of the biggest uh, eruptions that we'd ever seen. And we captured it with a spacecraft. Are you going to have to uh, monitor the, the ring in point for the Weber space spacecraft that's going to be parked on the other side of the moon? Probably NASA will be monitoring that. But we'll take any data they want to give us. So this hit a spacecraft called Stereo, which allowed us to capture the magnetic field. So the Stereo magnetic field is shown in blue and red. The negative part, the negative BZ, we call it, that is, or the southward pointing BZ, that's the stuff that connects with Earth really well. So we compared it to a storm called the Bastille Day storm, which is the line in green and black. And this is what happened on Bastille Day. Look at the nines. That was a really big geomagnetic storm. So this would have really walloped us. And Dan Baker at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at CU said, if it had hit, we'd still be picking up the pieces. Now, what he meant by that was it would probably have significant impacts, um, particularly on power. All right. And that's just uh, looking at it from the stereo spacecraft. <laughs> that's when it hit. And you can see BZ, let's see if we have it, BZ minus 50. That's huge. Usually we start getting some minor geomagnetic storming around minus 5, depending on how long it lasts. This was minus 50. Actually, minus 10, probably minus 10 would be when we start seeing... KPs of five. All right, this is how often periods with KP9 occur from cycle 17 all the way up to cycle 24. Uh, we didn't have any in 24, we didn't have any nines. We only had eights. So you can see with the smaller cycles, you don't see the nines as much. Now, there's another phenomenon called a coronal hole. These dark regions, they can actually produce geomagnetic storming as well, but usually minor to maybe moderate. Where the CME is a punch in the face to the magnetosphere, the coronal hole is like tickling the magnetosphere. It annoys it. You get some upset, but not the punch in the face. Here's a coronal hole. Now, guess what? These can persist. They can come around 27 days later. Great for forecasting. We have an aurora model called Ovation. We get a 30-minute and a three-day prediction. All right, what do I do with this as a radio amateur? This is from NA5N, Paul Harden. Uh, it's on the QRP ARCI webpage, if you're familiar with it. Um, he's got some good hints. If you're in a QSO and a major flare happens, take a break, wait for it to be over, go back to the radio, because the ionosphere is going to be pumped up, and you can get some good contacts immediately following until sundown, because you've got that extra boost. The uh, blackout's only for the duration of the flare event. And if you're below 10 megahertz, no sweat. Use current K index from WWV or on our website. Um, A indices is actually yesterday's geomagnetic condition. So K is more current. Like I said, updated every three hours. Now, putting orange dots around this one, magnetic field gets quiet following a strong geomagnetic storm for 12 to 24 hours. Excellent time to work 40 to 160 uh, due to very low noise levels. Yeah, I think that's good. That is true. But the reason I put the orange dots around it is because you can get something in the wake of a big geomagnetic storm called a maximum usable frequency depression or muff depression. And the maximum usable frequency will go down because you're gobbling up the chemical reactions that happen in the wake of a geomagnetic storm because that's huge energy input will eat up all the electrons. It's a quicker picker-upper. You can almost make the ionosphere go away for a while. So beware of those. And so solar flux, use it for above 10 megahertz. So I've been living on 40 meters, you know. <laughs> um, can index, good. 30 meters, kind of weird. It's kind of in the middle. I like it. That's where I made my longest contact with uh, 
my rock might. Longest distance. All right. We talked about these. It's, it's hard to predict. Um, we're getting better at the geomagnetic storms and are using machine learning for the flares. So we're trying to find ways to do this better all the time. That's what we do. Never let reports of flares at geomagnetic storms scare you off. Just turn the radio on. I go back to my 15-year-old self, even when everything's going crazy. I turn on the radio because sometimes you'll get local effects that we can't account for. We don't have the density of observations or the skill in modeling to capture everything. So I've had really great contacts during periods that should be less than great. And since I've gotten into FT8, I've been able to make contacts during this solar minimum that I never thought possible. I've made more contacts last year than I have in my whole life. I've been 30 years ham radio. More contacts using FT8 than I ever had in my whole life. It was insane. I got a card from that guy. I talked to, uh, God, I'm not going to remember his name. The dude who made FT8. Yeah, Joe, I talked to that dude on FT8. Oh, Please let us know if you can be of assistance as you complete your visit. We could probably give you about two because we got to reset the room. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's stuff going on in Congress. Legislation, they're looking at space. So they said, hey, this is important. It can hurt us. The more technologically dependent we become, the more it can hurt. And so there was a bill co-sponsored by Cory Gardner and another person who I don't remember. But it's working its way through the legislature. There are lots of things you can do. If you've never heard of HamSci, look that up. That's awesome. Those are scientists and ham radio operators, like me. It's awesome. They just got money, millions of dollars, $1.3 million, to build ham radio space weather sensors. There's a comic. Why does the sun set? Air rises. Sun's hot in the middle, so it goes up. It comes down in the evening when it cools off. Why does it go from east to west? Solar wind. <laughs> All right, and the, along the bottom are pictures of the forecast office, as it stands now. That's the evolution of my radio station. Look, I had rock mites. I contacted Hungary from Houston, Texas. That was nuts. 30 meters. <laughs> All right, that's all I have. I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.